Hey everyone, Bradley tuning in, coming at you with another video. Today I want to post a video that I did last night speaking with financial advisors. It gets right into detail. Some of the major things you want to consider when you invest in real estate and talk about the state of our 2018 Toronto real estate market and where things are headed. Stay tuned awesome. and enjoy. Your what a great introduction. Right. That's Thank awesome. You. That was like, yeah, follow that. I do <laughs> shout him out in the, in the PowerPoint. <laughs> but follow that introduction. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so yeah, we're going to talk about real estate investing. Um, I am going, this is going to be a little bit different presentation. Instead of leave questions to the end, I want questions as we go because that's going to help me kind of steer what direction we're going to talk about. Um, I, a lot of this presentation I spoke specific to the market because there's a lot of confusion as to what the market is doing these days. Um, but certainly I want to talk about cash flow, I want to talk about equity, I want to talk about even what areas we could, I, I don't have these in my presentation, but depending on what kind of questions we have, I want, I want that to steer the dialogue. So here, I built this specifically for you guys. Ooh. Because I, uh, I want this to be a bang. Thank you guys. So as kind of mentioned, my name is Bradley Watson. Um, actually, I can. So this is actually my high school sweetheart. Her name is Sandra. Uh, we've been happily married for three and a half years. Awesome. Don't quote me on that. All right, I could get stabbed. <laughs> um, and this is actually our plus one. Her name is Emily. She's actually, today I found out she was nine weeks. So they do the week thing. I call her two months, but nine weeks officially as of today. So happy birthday, Emily. <laughs> so this is my why. This is really why I do what I do. This is, and, and even in the way that I've invested in real estate, you'll see how that's really steered what I've done personally. Um, and these are the options that you guys will have looking in the future, whether, especially those of you who are young, you'll see that your lifestyle definitely changes the way that you go about doing things. All right, so I'm going to introduce you to, and I do have permission to use his name. His name is Ron. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. And... Um, Ron bought a property last year, okay? Let me tell you a little bit about Ron. So I went on a trip with Ron because Ron is 60 now, and he knows by age 65 he wants to retire, and he wants to live, he wants to do what a lot of seniors do, sell where he is now, move up north, and live the life of luxury at the age of 65. As UWFG people would know, the next question is, is how much money you got saved? How much money are, what are you playing with here? How much are we gonna have at the age 65? So I actually drove with Ron uh, he, he's taken a little bit of my time, but I love it because it's working for him. We actually drove out to Huntsville and back, actually further than Huntsville. So we, for the, over the course of a day, looking at different cottages, we, saw, we drove for over 10 hours. The only thing we knew when we got back after a 10 hour drive together, we got really close, was that he did not want to buy a cottage and he wanted to buy a rental property. That was the outcome, right? And all of this came from me explaining to Ron, these are some of the advantages. Now, Ron had $30,000. That's how much money he had. He wanted to buy a cottage, which he could have, but he was also looking to retire. And if possible, retire sooner, right? Didn't want to have to necessarily wait till 65. So I introduced him to this concept of rental properties. Just last year, we bought Ron in Cambridge, a rental property. You can't find these deals anymore. We bought a two unit. If anyone that's involved in real estate, you'd know this is a really sweet deal last year a two unit, and it's actually gone up in value since when the market was struggling. Um, two unit, uh, basement apartment, uh, he's finishing the basement, he bought it for $250,000. And that property now, now he actually was able to rent it to his daughter who lives in the upper unit and he himself lives in the basement. But he's able to, within the family, generate this wealth, right? That property, when we bought it for 250, I just checked it for him a couple months ago and it was up over 320, right? This was the mid last year, less than a year, and even in a tough market, he's doing real. Again, you're not gonna find a 250 property in Cambridge anymore, but it just shows you that success is there. So now, no longer is he talking about, hey, I wanna buy a cottage with $30,000. He's talking about, well, hey, what are my options? Do I wanna buy another rental property? Do I wanna sell this one? Do I wanna keep this one? Maybe refinance and pay our mortgage brokers and buy myself a cottage, right? So he's got options, and that's really the flip side. So you've got young people that want to create that nest egg down the road, but you also have people that genuinely have worked all their life, he works with his hands, very hard guy, raised a family, done very well, but he's got a little bit of money and he doesn't know what to do with it, real estate. All right, so question for you guys. What should you consider before you, real, you invest in real estate? There's no right and wrong answer here, I'm just curious, so if you guys were thinking about investing in real estate, I'm talking cash flow properties, I'm not talking buy a house, because that's not really investing in real estate, it is, but it's not, it's like buying Bitcoin, <laughs> no. I'm talking cash flow, right, you're looking for a cash flow equity property here, what, what are some of the things you'd want to think about? What are some of the things you want to consider? Location. Location, good. <laughs> right, we talked a little bit about that, yep. How much you have to put down? How much you put down, yep. Down payment. Financing. Financing options, yep. Potential. 
potential potential returns. Uh, potential returns. Yep. Uh, yeah. Potential profits. And potential cash. profits yeah. in cash flow. Yeah. Tenants. Kind of like the tenants. Good. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. I heard someone say uh, qualifying. Maintenance. Qualifying, qualifying for the mortgage. Yeah. yeah. Like credit score. Credit score. So it all ties in. Yeah. Good. Yeah. You guys are ready. Send you out into the world. So here's some of the options, some of the things that I would say to think about. You guys actually hit some of them. So first off, hiring your professionals. This is, again, where you guys can come in. You know, finding people that know what they're doing and having the right team ahead of time. You don't know how many deals I've seen that fall through because of a silly mortgage agent or lawyers that don't know what they're doing or people that just want to push you off as a number. Having the wrong people around you can really make a deal go sour and can cost a lot of money. Uh, so having the right people is the place to start. Risk tolerance, what are you looking for? Of course, investing. I mean, we're talking about uh, cash flow properties, but real estate as an investment vehicle is commercial real estate, office space, you know, um, gas station. I want to buy a business, right? There's so many things. So what is your risk tolerance is kind of the place to start. And then it goes type of investing. So then we can kind of zero in. Um, I, I personally spend a lot of my energy at, is rental units, uh, apartments, large multifamilies. Those, that's, that's really the big winner. There's so many reasons I could explain that, but that's another day. Uh, cash flow versus equity. This is a really interesting question nowadays because the challenge is that housing prices are high and rents haven't, they, they have gone up and I think they're going to continue to go up, but they're not going up at the same rate, of course, right? So to find a cash flow property, I'll show you some of the videos that I've been doing lately uh, on my channel. One of them spoke specifically to this and I've had other mortgage brokers say, you're so bang on. It is virtually impossible to find a positive cash flow property within 45 minutes of the city of Toronto. You have to go very far to get that cash flow. And we're talking even multiple units, unless you get a big, big apartment. Um, so that poses a unique question here. Now, if we can't find a positive cash flow, but downtown Toronto, if you look, uh, and I don't have the numbers right in front of me to back it up, but you guys can see when you're closer to the city, you tend to get higher equity returns. So someone that's looking the closer, the closer to the city, those people tend to be on the higher risk, but they see the higher returns on the equity side, but then they're exchanging the cash flow you get from some of the smaller areas. So let's, I think this hand was up first. Yeah. Uh, so you're saying so like, um, like away from the city, like uh, the small suburbs, say like yeah. a place like uh, Shelburne is a yeah. uh, potential lower risk. Uh, so if, if you can get the cash flow, yes. I now actually naturally, yeah, I would agree to that. Yeah. Um, especially if you can get something with more than one unit, you can, you can get the cash positive for sure. <laughs> Um, one thing I wanted to mention, or I thought about, was mm -hmm. for my for my kids especially, if you can get something along the subway line, along transit, the Eglinton cross town, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, especially with condos being five, four, five, six years out, mm -hmm. by the time there, there can be tons of delays. Um, that is one way around. Like it, the numbers may not work today, but you can bet in five years they'll look very, very free. Right, so, so that's, that's to mention. And, that, and that tends to line up with, what kind of public transit are you talking about? I'm talking about TTC TTC, yeah. okay. If you want to invest in Toronto. Yeah, and, Toronto and I Toronto. would even say there's people that are investing in London that are saying the same thing, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so public transit is an evolving, in Hamilton, the Hamilton's it's actually huge. even closer. Right, so, but that's also parts, that speaks to our location, a demographic. As someone had said uh, investing in a place where you get, what kind of tenants you get, that also matters. That was something that we saw as a challenge in Oshawa you probably find a similar one in Hamilton, right? So knowing, and I mean, Shelburne, what kind of community, what are they working, what kind of jobs are in the area? They're, these are all questions you need to consider for your location, right? Did you have another question? No, I just, uh, just figured it out. Yeah? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Light bulb hit, yeah. All right, cool, if you get a question, just let me know. Um, and then structure ownership speaks to how you set it up. You set it up as a corporation, sole proprietorship, partnership. A lot of people nowadays are starting to get into partnerships. I, I've heard somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% of first-time buyers get financial assistance now. So now how do you set that up do you, with your parents? Do you have them on title? Do you put 1% and this again, get a good lawyer, right? Do you give them 1%? Do you do 50-50? Do I partner with someone from school? Do I partner with family? Um, do they co-sign? Big word, right? Do they just back me up with all the liability and no financial profitability as, a, as helping me out? So there's, these are the different things you're gonna do. I have nowhere in here have I talked about money, right? I haven't talked about really costs. So the first question, what's the first question people think of? How much money do I got, right? How much money do I have? 
that's the place that people naturally start in. It'll tend to gravitate, but it actually influences the way that you're investing as well. So we tend to, yes, it's a factor, but we leave it till the end, right? If, of course, we're not going out and buying uh, 12 unit homes, but um, this should be, in deciding what area you want to invest, it shouldn't be a factor until the very end. Cool? All right, question for you guys. This is a winner. Here we go. So now we're gonna, before we move on, does anybody have any questions about how to invest? Uh, again, we can talk a little bit more at the end, um, based on time. But I want to give you guys a market update. This is, I love this stuff. This is why I, I, I want to solve for you guys what exactly is going on in the market, what's it going to do, at least give you some confidence. Um, so let me ask you guys, is the market going up or the market going down? And if you're bold enough, why? It's going down, okay. Any reason? My, my personal reason is the fact that with the uh, number of people that are over leveraged and everyone's in a holding pattern because mm -hmm. the interest rates are heading up mm -hmm. slowly. Now, I don't think they're gonna put, make three. They were talking of three rate increases this year. Right. I think they'll probably just do two. Right. In, in the Canadian market, in the States, they may go to three. Yeah. And um, that's one reason, uh, just the amount of- Like a quarter percent. Yeah, so quarter half a percent. percent. And, I, and I actually kind of agree with you. That's, that's the number I've been using. Deserve. Um, which is good, coming from a mortgage broker. So that gives you an idea of interest rates. Okay, so it's going down because of interest rates. Any other thoughts? It's going up or down? You guys don't have to know. That's why I'm here. It was okay. low, but I don't know if it's going back it low. up yet. Could be going back up? It went down. Maybe. But it also depends on the local market also. Yeah, that actually is a very good starting point. All of these have to do with what's going on locally. Okay, I'm giving you GTA, Golden Horseshoe, all the numbers and trip, right? But absolutely, like it's it really depends on even community, not even necessarily yeah. city. So that that's why you can't take all. But this is just to give you guys a head start. You know what's going on? Because the, uh, the, the gene of Finch is not going to go up forty percent. Right. More part, absolutely. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. There's your cash flow versus equity right there. Yeah. Perfect example. But right. Barry and North, our prices are going up still. Mm -hmm. Now you guys are outside. You guys are outside. Outside of the GTA is right? still going up. The, um, yeah, but, but it's slow. Like, it's slow, but it's still it's still holding its value. Yeah. So so all of this is macro. Okay, we're gonna take a macro approach. There you go. Both are correct. The housing prices are going down, and the housing prices are going up. How's that for confusing, right? So if you take if you take the average price in Toronto Real Estate Board uh, across on a macro perspective, we're actually down about 4%, okay? Prices are down. But if you take the HPI composite benchmark price, prices are up. What's the difference between these two? Has anyone heard of the HPI? Do you guys know what that is? So the HPI is really cool because what it does is, you know, you guys know what average price is, right? Average price is everything all in a pool divided by how many sales that you have. The HPI is actually a little more specific. It actually it softens the major shifts because it takes very specific areas. So for example, a two-story in Bramalee, Brampton, uh, detached home, the average HPI, the HPI benchmark that it was set, I think it started in 2009, was the start of HPI has grown to this much and will continue over a three. So what this does, the composite benchmark is a number that Treb likes to use a little bit because it actually seems to soften a lot of the results, uh, especially in a market that's struggling like this one. Um, but it actually in a sense is more accurate as well because it's talking to a very specific segment. All of these numbers are based on comparing to the, the uh, benchmark in that area. So I would argue in, in a way this one is actually more accurate, um, but both are correct. And this is why there's so much confusion. Let me explain to you why the price is down, but the average benchmark is up. Because we gotta go by segment, right? So when we break it down by segment, if you look at the townhomes, they're actually doing pretty good, moderate growth across the board. Uh, but the detached and the semi-homes, especially, the, yeah, just, right? Uh, are they negative? No, but they're flatlined, right? This is the killer right here. This is the, this is the money maker. Because what's happened with affordability, with interest rates, with qualifying with the mortgage, and we can go on that, what happened last year and all the guideline changes are just crazy. People aren't buying luxury homes as much anymore. They're coming off the market, they're not selling. So the average, when you take off the high end, goes down, right? But when you look at it by segment, none of these sections have actually declined 
um, on the average sale price. And uh, of course, condos have huge growth, double digit growth, and they're still going up. How long is that gonna last? Well, you're gonna have to listen to my uh, condo update video because I think it's actually, I'll give you guys a head start. I think it's gonna happen mid this year. You're gonna see the double digit slowdown because it's just unfeasible to continue at this rate. Especially since in downtown Toronto, like they're running out of space. Mm -hmm. Where else are they going? Yeah. Actually, they just announced uh, on the waterfront a new development. Oh, yeah, because uh, yeah? a proposed new development. Yeah. Because it isn't like, uh, like one of the big businesses, I think it's Amazon. Um, that's right, on the east end of Toronto. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna, you're, you guys, your timing is perfect. Um, so let me, no, it's good. This is, this is the flow, right? So before, before I talk about um, kind of the pluses and the minuses, first off is uh, listing activity, right? So you guys can see that there now these numbers um, are annual. I'm going based on January because that's our left last month. They're not gonna do the full impact of any declines, but you definitely see there was a decline last year. Uh, of course, if listings are lower, prices are higher, right? Yeah. So we actually want this number, if we want prices up, to go down. So they did start to go down. We saw it before January. April 17th, everything seemed to go to hell in a handbasket. So now when we look at our numbers, they actually tend to line up with a normal market. They tend to come, they bounce back, right? So same with the active listings. So we've got the new listings and the active listings. So as far as listings go, there was a time when I think it was up like 60% listings went up last year. But uh, we seem to be back to normal levels again, right? Even though it seems like we're not so doing so hot, we're actually doing pretty good. Things are lining up with previous years. Okay, so I wanna address what we just talked about here. So where will prices go? So there's various reasons. So first off, the market's gonna go down. Why would we think that? Mortgage guidelines is a big one. I think that's actually, in a way, more applicable than even the interest rate changes. But we've got interest rate changes. We've got affordability as a general issue. We talked about debt being over 160%. So these are the reasons why the market would go down, and I agree, right? We're but these are kind of economic issues. But why would the market go up? First off is seasonal fluctuations. We're standing in February. Seasonally, you'll see in a minute what kind of fluctuations we have. Even forget the market and how it's doing, depending on season. But we're also entering as a world-class city of Toronto. Um, Toronto, speaking to what you guys talked about, is very much like New York, Manhattan, right? It is, it is artificially, because of the green belt, has become an artificial barrier to, to and we've seen that spillover, but it's kind of forcing that, uh, that upward trend, right, in the market. And of course, we've got a supply issue. Um, and the supply issue uh, is just, I mean, take, you don't have to go much further than developers and the, the lack of supply coming into the market um, to talk about how bad our supply issue is. So historical information is our best indicator. How are we doing for time? You're okay? Yeah. You tell me if I got like, Yeah. yeah you tell me when I'm, I'm done. How much? 20. 20. Oh, lots of time. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Okay. So here is our red tape, right? That's, this is what's killing us is this green belt. I mean, it's great. It's beautiful. I live up in Calvin. I love it. It's wonderful. But uh, what it's done is it's really limited where the city of Toronto can extend. I mean, we've got an overflow into the, Guelph and Waterloo, Cambridge down here, you know? But generally, in this area, we're almost full. I think, I mean, they've got enough supply to, to satisfy another 20 or 30 years, but people are aware that it's limited, right? Like there's, 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 a, there's an upper ceiling that we can't get over, and it's this. Unless there's, and there's been a number of attempts to add highways to go through it. There's been people trying to add gravel pits. I've talked to clients up north that, want, that are that are all being successful in preventing this green belt from extending or from, from shrinking, right? They're holding it. They're, they're actually doing a very good job. Will that change that road? Maybe, but for the time being, everyone knows that we are, we are captive. This is why if you go across all of Canada, we see generally the real estate prices are going down, but where are they not? Toronto and Vancouver. Both of those are landlocked by, by major, I mean, in, in our case, we've got the green belt in Vancouver, they've got the mountains, right? So you both are seeing that same supply issue. Make sense? You're about to be in the ocean. <laughs> in the ocean. Yeah. In our case, the lake. Or oh, unless you build on yeah, the lake. You got the lake. Yeah. 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 All right. So let's talk about trends, right? Best evidence of what's going to happen is historical trends. Okay. So let's look at what's happened since I got since 2010. Okay. So you got 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and then 17 just decided to take a holiday. <laughs> you know. So, so generally, uh, so as of today, this right here is where we are now. So you can actually see that we're actually less, again, average price than we were last year. 
But it seems that since 2010, everything's been pretty predictable, right? Like we see this kind of predictable, slightly higher, just slowly moving up, but you see the seasonal fluctuations, which we were talking about, right? So as you kind of get into the May market, I think I've only seen two or three years over the last 20 or 30 years that May hasn't been the highest selling month of the year. Uh, last year was one of them because everything tanked in April. By May, it was gone, right? So last year was an exception to the rule. May's down here, right? which is going to pose a really interesting, it's going to mean something very interesting for us soon. Yeah. Just a quick uh, question uh, or comment is I do know that in April everything came to a standstill, but then everybody and the ant decided, oh, Let's probably lock in our gains and they just flood the market with listings. Now, a lot of them weren't even serious about right. selling. Yeah. And this is back really, in the, like mid 2017. Yeah. yeah. And that's why we saw that 60% increase in listings. Yeah. And then that definitely they kind of died down now and now we're back to. And that's, and, and the slide that we had that listings, the new listings and, the, and uh, that listing you can see has, yeah. has fixed itself. All that issues that we were facing, which were caused by a supply issue, which isn't fixed yet have now rebounded because of the psychological impact of that change that happened. Yeah. Um, so we see 2010 to 2014 predictable gains, seasonal trends, everything seems normal. I don't know if you guys have caught it, but if we look at around 2015, remember I told you I bought my first investment property in 2014? It was here, right? It seems to kind of that gap seems to have gotten a little bigger. And then the gap gets a little bigger, and then the gap gets a little bigger. You see that happening? So every year, this kind of natural growth all of a sudden started to, to go really quickly. And we started seeing, oh, we're in a bubble, everything's gonna crash, you know? Um, and that's what that is. You've got the prices are growing, they're following the, the season, but they're actually speeding up. And again, these have to do with our supply issue that we see in the city of Toronto and accelerating prices because listings started to come down, people saw that opportunity, and then it kind of created its own storm. But in 2017, we had that psychological impact. So, but what I want to show you guys is this kind of, so this is the first time since 2010 that we saw that a year went below the year before, right? We can see that that's not normal. But I also want to tell you guys that that's not the first time that that's happened. This actually has happened in the recent past, in 2008. In September 2008, uh, everything, I mean, that was a major collapse and everything seemed to switch. So if I were to kind of illustrate this, the red line is 2008. The change happened, what, in September? So we start to see that what should have been kind of a, another little bump never happened, and it kind of went down. T taking us into 20, 20, what, 20, 2008, we see that it actually is lower, right? Like we've actually, we've, we've come down now to a point where the prices are now less, which is very similar to what we are in now, right? Um, but we start to see that that kind of corrects itself in the springtime, which is nine months later. Um, my thoughts, again, if you follow some of my videos, you'll see my thought is the main reason is actually because the way that we calculate statistics in real estate, which is we do year over year. We compare everything year over year because it seems to generally be predictable. But in times like this, if you're following a year over year, you actually don't get the proper picture of what's going on in the market. So what happened here? So we saw January, February, March. The gains, I mean, it's a negative, right? The average price is down, but we see that it's actually going up and it's actually accelerating at a faster pace. So when we see year over year, we see the growth is happening quicker, people start to freak out, oh my God, and then all of a sudden it literally launches itself into the fall, right? Like it, it actually shot beyond what should have probably even happened, it, it kept going. Um, and then it kind of went back and that's where we start to see that normality, right? So does that make sense? Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so that takes us to now, right? So this is us now. This is that crazy uh, behemoth roller coaster that we saw earlier, right? And uh, and we see right now. So this is to take our price now, right? Based on what could happen, right? I don't I don't even want to say what will happen, but let's say what could happen. Based on what Remax says, it's going to be zero percent. World page says six point eight percent. I've heard eight percent, but then the interest rates went up. So we'll call it it's somewhere in there, right? It's not going to go down, but it's going to flatline at a worst case scenario. But what will happen, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is we're gonna to start to see that year over year start to close, and people are gonna to start to see in the next month, where are we, February here, right? It's actually, in the next month or two, it's gonna get worse. But there's going to come a point in April, May, I'm telling a lot of my clients that are looking to sell that you really wanna catch the spring market this year because you're gonna see, in my opinion, this is just based on growth, this has nothing to do with this analysis, but there will come a point somewhere in here 
where people are like, well, wait a minute, now everything is so much better than it was last year and the market is accelerating because at the same rate, because keep in mind we're here, at the same rate that that's going down, even if this doesn't change to them a year over year, that actually is accelerating. That's an accelerating, because it was a decelerating that happened last year, and a year over year it's gonna naturally be an acceleration. So this is one of the things that I'm really excited about uh, for my clients this year. People that are looking to buy into real estate, I'm telling them to do it now, between now and, if you wait until March, April, you're, you're getting up, you're kinda late. Uh, but if you wanna sell, you wanna wait till the spring. So this is a market, I, I know I, hopefully I didn't go too far into the market side, and I wanna give you guys an op opportunity. I don't have uh, too much more. These are some pictures from the videos that I do. Uh, you can see some of the topics uh, that we've talked about. We do predictions and uh, just general rental stuff. Um, posted one on Wednesday talking about um, uh, the new rental uh, lease agreements, the standard lease agreements. And uh, yeah, so uh, I'll leave my contact as well. Um, oh, as well, I'm here for you guys. If you have any questions on real estate beyond just today, if you have questions, um, I'll leave my contact. And uh, if you need connections to the industry to build those list of professionals, we can do that. Uh, if you want me to attend meetings with your clients, I'm happy to. And uh, I mean, for you guys personally, if you want help with investing, I can help there. So here's, here's my contact. Awesome. Sweet, thank you. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. I'll, I'll leave that up until I get picked up.